thank you for, for inviting me. Thank you for all the good work that you all do as part of the mission here at Common Hospital. And thank you for allowing me to present some new and exciting and updates of thoracic oncology in general, uh, and more specifically, some of the therapeutic endeavors we're trying to provide here uh, for our patients. So here we go. Um, so first off, some disclosures I think are appropriate. Uh, financial disclosures, none. I work at Carpenter Hospital. <laughs> um, intellectual disclosures, I should, should mention that I believe that multidisciplinary cancer care uh, can be multimodal, being multidisciplinary, um, and multiple different approaches. Evidence-based, we should give science to the bedside, not just to make it up necessarily as we go along. Expert and delivered, expert and delivered, we should do the right thing correctly, every single time, make sure we're doing it, and locally provided. We actually can do really good stuff here without transferring out to big places with big fancy names. All right, here's another one. So before we get into the therapeutic oncology portion, I want to make sure we have some basic lung cancer background to kind of go through real quick. Uh, I want to mention uh, some of the great work that's happened in the lung cancer screening uh, protocols and things we've done through the hospital to screen our high-risk smokers or former smokers. Um, and talk about uh, therapeutic bronchoscopy, what it is, why we would want to do it, and some of our experience to date and then draw some conclusions at the end. And as we go through, feel free to answer questions as we can, as I can clarify, okay? And no, I'm, I'm thoroughly incapable of standing behind the podium for any presentation I've ever given. So, lung cancer. So cancer uh, statistics across the country. Uh, there is by far, far more prostate cancer and female breast cancer than any other type of cancer. These are much more common. Essentially, they live long enough to have exposure and risk to these things, okay? Lung cancer is third on this list of frequency of cancer diagnosis. Okay. In the United States, uh, between 2006 and 2015, uh, 234,000 people annually are diagnosed with lung cancer per annual over the country. Uh, and 154,000 patients will die due to their disease. Okay. So if we then look at cancer-related mortality, not just the diagnosis the development thereof, lung cancer far outstrips the more frequently occurring diseases. So the, the disease itself is more lethal uh, once it develops. Prostate cancer and breast cancer still are significantly important, as in all the other diagnoses, but in terms of frequency and risk and mortality to our population, and, and uh, lung cancer is, is where it's happening. Okay. Traditional risk factors, a lot of these risk factors are not particularly uh, surprising. Personal smoking exposure, second hand smoking exposure to a much lesser degree are the primary risks. Uh, ionizing radiation, uh, such as radon, which is predominantly a smoking related issue, that's where the data is the most robust. Uh, therapeutic radiation, in terms of someone who had thoracic radiation for treatment of Hodgkin's disease years ago, uh, that's a, a risk factor for development of a new lung cancer. Occupational environmental exposure, such as asbestos. Asbestos exposure is at synergistically with uh, lung can with smoking with regard to development of lung cancer. Uh, family history is contributory, and COPD and other benign lung diseases, by way of ongoing habitual inflammation to the chest, is associated with lung cancer development, even after you match for a number of cigarettes smoked in the lifetime. So interesting, the, the biology is a tremendously active place of research currently, and the more you look, the more you're able to find specific genetic mutations in the lung cancer cells. Then that these cells are driven by gene mutation such and such. The more you look, the more you find. Up to over two thirds can be found, over 60% in some series can have some driver mutation found. Thus far, individual mutations of the genetic code of the tumor cells are individually uncommon and much more common in the non-smoker patient or the never-smoker population as opposed to their smoking pain Some examples, the EGFR receptor found in about, say, 15% of the adenocarcinoma subgroup of lung cancer. There's other mutations, it's called ALK or ROS1, that are in the between the 1 and 4% range of lung cancer patients. So not a huge number. However, over the course of population, these will eventually happen enough times so you can do something different and these are susceptible to targeted therapy, which has significantly better therapeutic benefit and significantly less toxicity, particularly compared to its, uh, historic comparators of chemotherapy. Another new addition to the, the molecular characterization that I have to do when I'm biopsying someone is to make sure that I'm a pure pathologist to look at 
protein expression to the surface, because this PDL1 surface protein allows the, the, the oncologist to use immune therapy to activate the patient's immune system to fight the cancer. It's a very interesting way, and it has shown some significant progress. Okay? Just to know about the, not to, to ever have to spit out all these very, very funny words, um, but it shows the, the tremendous progress. Up until probably well, maybe 10 years ago, the primary benefit in terms of how do you treat someone with lung cancer has essentially been the anti-emetics, anti nausea medicines to get someone through their regimen. That's probably where the biggest benefit was. The agents have been basically the same for 20 to 30 years. Platinum-based agent plus something else. But something else is there, but basically it's been people don't have so much horrible symptoms. These new agents, of which there are now multiple, and many, many more clinical trials, are either developed, approved by FDA, or in late-stage clinical trials, targeting these genetic markers of protein markers. So there's actually significant basic science and understanding of the biology of the disease that allows us to take a much better care of our patients, particularly in the advanced um, or metastatic setting. Okay, so that's all the, wow, isn't medical oncology interesting? Part? And isn't lung cancer common and bad? Yes, we agree. Uh, some of the things just to know about how we stage lung cancer, it focuses on the same T, N, M staging as every other solid tumor, by and large. The T stands for tumor, which is essentially size or local invasion of the, of the primary tumor. The bigger it gets, the higher number. The more it invades, the higher number, going from one to four. Okay? That's the T stage. That's then coupled with an N stage or nodal stage of the disease. If you have lymph nodes involved in the lung of the primary thing, that's given the designation of N1. Lymph nodes in the middle, right around the trachea, on the same side or midline of the primary thing, that's called N2 disease. Lymph nodes up and out of the chest, out near the, the neck, uh, or on the opposite side of the primary target, that's an N3 disease. Why this matters, this is what I do a lot of my comments on, on the biopsy of these, these lymph nodes, is because you take basically any T stage, any N1 stage, and you get into this green box. This green box is stages zero through two. This treatment modality up front, assuming they are in decent enough shape to tolerate the task, the primary treatment will be surgical resection of the entire lobe of lung. Five lobes in the chest, you take out one of them, rough ballpark, lose 20% or so of lung function. We're fortunately blessed with tremendous capacity in excess of need, a lung. So if someone has normal lung function, they lose 15, 20 percent. By and large, they're not really going to notice that uh, in terms of their shortness of breath or respiratory compromise or symptoms. So we assess them, make sure they can tolerate it. Then they'd be in the green box and it comes out. Okay. Stage three disease, which is important because anyone who has this midline node or opposite size node, those are no matter what the size of the primary tumor. Those are automatically stage 3A or 3B, or perhaps higher. In which case, the primary treatment is not go to the operating room and have it all taken out. The primary treatment is going to be chemotherapy and radiation in some combination based on their comorbidities and exercise tolerance. And then a very small number of patients after stage 3A will then have resection down the road. But by and large, groups in here are almost always going to have chemotherapy and radiation alone. That's generally where it ends up. A small minority can have resection number of most of them. <clears throat> Outside of that, for stage four disease, that's a metastatic disease, those are patients who have disease outside of the organ involved or in the opposite lung. In which case, surgery is not the right thing to do. We shouldn't take out the primary thing if it's already spread throughout the body. You want to hurt someone by doing that. The primary treatments on chemotherapy alone, within radiation therapy directed at problematic sites of interest. For instance, uh, a painful uh, bone and passes to a uh, hip. Radiation spot welding, targeting the, the symptoms. Brain uh, lesion, radiation for the symptoms. That's the kind of idea. Okay, but primary surgery is not appropriate. Okay, so we have stages one through four. Okay. Staging not only matches and predicts what we should do for a patient in terms of what treatment modalities we should describe to them, uh, it also uh, predicts survival. So the most uh, updated um, survival registry across the across the planet 
uh, use basically different ways to break down these T, N, and M's, generate a clinical stage, one through four, and then track their survival over 72 months. Not surprising, the things that are stage one, which are the, the, the blue and the red and the green, have much better survival. That's the rate of survival out of 72 months, 80% are better. And then most of those people before they expect to be alive 72 months later. We always like to think that everyone will be alive three years on the road. It's not always feasible. But that's much better than their metastatic injury of stage four disease, in which case the vast majority are not alive even up to that number. Average survival in stage four disease is still in the order of months. Six to nine months based on which registry you look at. If you look at randomized trials where they're selecting healthier people to be studied in the study, um, to be enrolled in the study, average survival will be around a year. Maybe half so like longer, half shorter. Okay. So this performance status is important. If someone is so short of breath they can't walk them to the medical oncologist's office to be treated, or the radiation oncologist's office to be treated, they're clearly going to have a very bad prognosis. Their abilities to tolerate the therapies they need to have a chance at durable improvement, they won't be able to tolerate it. Okay. Um, and one other mention in the prior iteration of this, when they had a, they began to cohort of patients, uh, it was again shown that the vast majority of lung cancers are diagnosed at an advanced stage, age stage 3A or higher. Because patients don't come in until they have symptoms, and symptoms only happen if someone already has lots of disease progression. So, it gets us to why we're doing screening as an important feature of what we do here at the hospital. We want to take care of the patient individual, but the population as well. Simultaneous task. So it is now recommended from the Preventive Service Task Force, grade B, which is the same level of recommendation that the monitor gets for the appropriately selected uh, female patient. They would endorse ages between 55 and 80. Asymptomatic means no signs of active cancer, it means they're not having all these scary things of coughing out blood or losing weight for no good reason. Uh, and appropriately risk by smoking status. We have to interview our patients and say, how much did you smoke? And when did you quit? And what did you average? And how long did you smoke? If we get to approximately one pack a day times 30 years, or some way to make 30 as the mathematical product, they are eligible if they have either currently smoked or have quit in the past. Okay. The trick is we don't really know, based on the current level of the evidence, when we should stop doing screening. We get it started. That part is still a work in progress, although it's really right. Should we screen for five years and stop? 10 years and stop? We don't know. There's no data in that regard. We're still a work in progress. Okay. Uh, how about cancel patients who are going to go about this or come see me because they have a little small nodule found by accident? Uh, as I, I tell them information about this. I tell them who was involved. I tell them this is a, this study used three years of, act of imaging, but then six and a half years of follow to kind of see what was going to happen to these patients. The people who are enrolled in this study all had the smoking exposure and had annual PET scans and versus annual x-rays. They thought they couldn't do a nothing as the placebo control, so they did it with the x-ray. It was a gigantic endeavor, 53,000 patients enrolled across 33 centers in the country. This is a big, big study. Okay. The interesting part we know about is CAT scan, CAT scan technology is so good, we find a lot of things. Namely that, if you scan enough people who had smoking exposure, you'll find a lot of dots, a lot of little specks which are probably nothing, but they're found, we have to deal with it. So, almost 40% of the patients over three years will find this something. So we have to deal with how do we counsel, counsel patients about those little things they find. However, 96% of those things detected were ultimately nothing after I follow. Little spot, little nothing, leave it alone. Okay, but we have to do the follow-up to prove it and counsel the patients so they're not worried if they have something really scary happening. Okay. The phrase I use, uh, when I see patients like this in clinic, is I say, you have a little dot in your lungs. Because I think uh, the historic pattern was, my, oh my goodness, my doctor found a spot on my lung. I think that was based on when we only had x-rays. And x-rays only find big things by comparison. X-ray, PET scans can find things in the order of millimeters. Very, very small. So if an x-ray finds your thing, it has to be quite big, in which case it really is a problem. That's, that was, so this idea that I found a spot, it became ominous and scary. Based on technology now, it doesn't have to be, because these little dots 
almost sound comical by that word. So I use that word on, on purpose. And thus far, most patients leave the room joking and laughing. So it is a good thing. But despite all of that thing of finding these little bit of things that might not matter, the study did show relative reduction in the rate of lung cancer death and did show an absolute reduction in mortality during the study. So we, the study showed it saved lives. Spent a lot of money, did a lot of counseling, had to hold a lot of patients' hands, they weren't scared, but ultimately saved lives. This is a good one. Okay, screen, now we need to screen, so 250 persons annually for three years for a one lung cancer rate of death. Similar order of magnitude of how many do we need to test to find something that really matter that's comparable to mammography. Okay. So different societies have put out recommendations. The one, the American College of Chest Physicians, I'm a lung doctor. This is, this is the one I put most stock in. I think it's pretty well phrased. It says, do lung cancer screening if you can provide good care that matches that study. Essentially, you're going to treat them with good quality science, good expert uh, uh, delivery of the surgery, essentially. Okay. Preventive Service Task Force, as I said, still grade B recommendation. The one outlier due to the relatively short on follow-up and risk of how much money we're going to spend as a society doing this. Uh, American Association of Family Practitioners was really the sole outlier society that did not endorse screening. Reasonably because we're concerned that we're, they are concerned that they could have a false sense of security if a smoker to continue smoking despite getting pictures of you. And thus far, we don't really know how long we need to do this. The study was six years. The guidelines now have the possibility of 22 years of imaging. 22 years could be a long time. That might not be right. It might be, we don't know yet. Okay, so we then, to get this screening thing done, hanging all these nodules and all these little dots and specs, we had to make sure our workflow for the pulmonary specialties, the thoracic specialties, could take care of the results. See patients on time fashion, make sure results aren't lost to follow up. Counseling group, I have four folks coming into, diagnosing them with their emphysema that they never previously knew about. Uh, so we had to work with you know, my office, thoracic surgery, radiology, uh, and to kind of make sure all this would start to work seamlessly. Okay? This is coordinated by pulmonary staff in my office, MAs and clinical nurse leaders, supervised by physician, pulmonary physician, me being a, a predominant feature of that for my group. Um, we make sure how many patients get the information both by letter and by telephone call, uh, so they can get the information on how many fashion and step back to the primary care doctors who are ordering this information and referrals are generated when there's a sufficient amount of risk. Okay? So with all this, and to make sure we can be reimbursed, because CMS has to give us the money to keep the lights on, um, we uh, got ourselves designated a, a lung cancer screening center uh, by the American College of Radiology. This is a requirement for CMS to be part of our registry as part of these requirements. So we did that. Um, so we had to include demographic data, dose of the diagnostic imaging we're using, Diagnosis results and the ACR credit, all of which we had to pursue to do this. If you're going to do something, you, you do it right or you don't do it. So the requirements, I said they were all based on CMS eligibility criteria, which really just matched that big clinical study. I just Here's a picture of our lovely CAT scanner. This is from Dr. Tyler Zappin of radiology, who helped with these slides. Uh, we have to provide smoking cessation. Well, if the smoking is the reason they're getting the picture and smoking is bad for them, we should keep working on smoking cessation. Although this is very difficult, we should keep trying. We can talk about risks and benefits, because, well, there is downside to every test we do, good and bad. We should do both. And they should be willing to do this, right? They should consent to their own care with good counseling counsel. Okay, and it's for lung cancer screen. It's, this particular protocol is not for someone who's having active symptoms you're investing with. It's a different style. Okay, so where? For the Concord Hospital, Concord Avenue sites. So Concord Hospital, Concord Avenue in Pillsbury, or Chupan, weekdays, dorms in those hours, weekends too. The scan itself is very quick. Three or four seconds. Uh, no IV contrast, so no need of folks. This is a big thing to celebrate. Uh, and the study should take up 15 minutes of their day coming in and out of the clinic. So it's a relatively fast thing. Okay? And no prep recovery because no one loves colonoscopy because of the prep. And this is not requiring such a thing. So long enough to get the win. Uh, so the, the result of what you get from a scan is you get a category. This is stylized in the same way that mammography is, is interpreted, categories one, two, three, four, to describe level of risks and what do you do about it. Categories one and two, there's nothing. Continue lung, lung cancer screening on an annual basis. Category two, there's a tiny little speck of something, it's probably nothing. See you in a year, continue the annual screening pool, assuming you're so eligible. Positive exams, 
are categories three and four. Category three, this is something, it could be important. It's still probably not statistically. It's only about a, about a three to three percent chance that'll be a cancer. But we take a picture six months instead of 12. Category four, so these are the things that look a little bigger, a little bit angrier with how speculated and irregular border they are. The little module here uh, is irregular border, and you're like, well, those, you can imagine on a microscopic level, those cells kind of growing and invading and not behaving nicely. So you worry about something that looks like that. Uh, now we get a, a lung cancer CT called the three months. Say, is this thing going to change in a, in a timely fashion? In a quick fashion. Uh, for B, but the A and B designation, the X designation, are the Wow, there's something in the chest that we're going to give a number to, but oh my, there's something else too. There's a something in the bone. There's a big fluid collection around the lung. There's something else that suggests this is actively bad now. And those folks are have a, uh, a more expedited evaluation of something now. Another thing as we've done, all category threes and higher's automatically get referred to our lung nodule clinic. We then we then review the, the results and then and prioritize them to go to directly from thoracic surgery. If it sounds like that person should really just meet a surgeon and have this thing taken out, and they should skip a step in my office, because we should do it in a timely fashion. The rest of them can probably just have these little things that come to us. And although we count them about their nodule, we count them about their smoking cessation, we then say, oh, you're short of breath doing stuff. This has never been evaluated before. You're short of breath doing how much? Oh, that's not very good. You have emphysema, you was never diagnosed. We diagnose their emphysema, we switch start treatment, and particularly, uh, we find sufficient burden of our COPD or emphysema, we'll get them into pulmonary rehabilitation to get their functional status improved. And despite my trying for the past six years, I have yet to find a way to oversell the good work pulmonary rehab does. It's really hard. I've struggled. I've tried. Because everybody does it better with exercise, especially if it's exercise with peers, encouraged, counseled, safe. It's glorious. Seeing someone walk on a treadmill with oxygen in is a pretty, pretty magical thing. And age range has been between ages 21 and 96. We take everybody. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Okay, so now we're going to, that's all the, the project globally <coughs> of thoracic oncology. Medical oncology advances, detection imaging advances. So this is good. We're trying to find things early, different ways of taking care of them if they come in late. And here's one of the things we're adding in to take care of things when they're found late or they're causing symptoms. Okay? So therapeutic bronchoscopy. Historically, bronchoscopy in most scenarios is a diagnostic maneuver. It makes a diagnosis. It sees there's a, a, an infection, there's a cancer, there's a something. And it makes a test to find out what's the cause. It doesn't treat the cause in any way, but it just says, what is it? Okay? And this has value. There's a lot of value to diagnostic bronchoscopy. I'm quite a fan, actually. Um, but this is a different idea. Okay? So why therapeutic bronchoscopy in addition to diagnostic bronchoscopy? is some of the complications of chest malignancies. This is focusing on lung cancer, but I'll go through a, a, some examples toward the end. Uh, it's not just lung cancer that can merit and benefit from some of these interventions. Okay? So in some series, it's up, up to 20 to 30% of lung cancer patients will develop complications of airway obstruction. So the central air tubes, right enough main stem bronchus or low bar, one of the primary sections of the lung, can get blocked up, leading to collapse of that section of the lung, Blockage so they can't get their mucus out, so they get infected with pneumonia. Or just having shortness of breath and cough. They just can't get around. They're not infected today. They're just so short of breath. They can't do what they need to do to go get to their treatment. And up to 40% of lung cancer mortalities can be attributed to local or regional disease. And it just compromises lung function so much, they ultimately uh, expire due to respiratory compromise. Interesting, there's good evidence that the prognosis of treated malignant central airway obstruction. So there's something blocking up the main trachea, you clean it out, you stage them, their prognosis is going to be similar as if they never had that airway obstruction at all. You're not changing their stage, uh, perhaps, but you are changing their ability to tolerate the treatment they otherwise couldn't get. There's also good evidence that urgent or emergent intervention can rapidly decrease the level of care. By that I mean Patient admitted to ICU on a ventilator because their lungs collapse due to a tumor. Alleviate the obstruction, reinflate their lung, get them off a the ventilator, transfer to the medical ward. This is a good thing. This is an upgrade in that patient's status. All this said, patients admitted to hospital with shortness of breath, and they cough out some blood, 
due to central airway obstruction. Again, treat the obstruction, alleviate the compromise of that section of lung, discharge to home, more facility perhaps, in a better shape, decreasing the level of care. So ICU to floor, floor to home. And in our current state, or our historic state, uh, has required tra transfer to tertiary care, so particularly Massachusetts, where some of this expertise has been developed uh, more commonly over the years to their case volume in large centers. Okay. And all hospitals are busy. Almost all hospitals are on max capacity almost all the time, more or less. So it's not been uncommon that when we try to have hospitals with hospital transfers, patients have been waiting for multiple days with a collapsed lung, short of breath, and no place to go. And that's not really great service to our customers that we want to take care of here in a timely fashion. Okay. So, how do we think about these central airway obstructions? This is trachea, right left main stem bronchus, kind of first order big pipes of the lung. Well, airway obstruction, either <coughs> acute, meaning that just collapsed all of a sudden and they came in with, I, I got short breath today, or I've got short breath over the last few weeks and now I'm getting medical attention because I had an abrupt change after that gradual slope, or I come to imaging with I'm just more and more and more tired, more and more tired, and that's what I'm okay. But essentially, there's either either camp of the speed of the progression. They can be thought of, is the target only inside the air tube? Endoluminal disease only? So stuff in the pipe. The pipe's normal, but there's just crud in the pipe. You know, clean the crud out of the pipe. Is it extrinsic compression? The pipe is normal, nothing in it. It's just getting crushed from outside in. Yeah, that's extrinsic compression. Or some combination thereof. Stuff in the pipe and the pipe's crushed. Okay. And different modalities need to be employed for different scenarios. If something's crushing the pipe from the outside in, you can't carve out all the stuff inside because there's nothing there. You have to prop it open with some mechanical support device. If there's crud filling up the airway, but the airway wall is not squished. Well, you don't need a stent to hold open the airway that's normal. You just need to clean out the pipe. Okay. Okay. So talk about the modalities. How could we do this? What are what are known in the therapies? Roughly speaking, these are categorized into hot therapies and cold therapies. Okay. Hot therapies uh, deliver energy to the patient's airway through a bronchoscope directly at the target tissue. Electrical therapies of electrocautery or autoimmune plasma coagulator, which I'll come back to in a little bit more. Laser therapy, photodynamic therapy, or bracket therapy. Photodynamic therapy will not uh, use, essentially, it's a uh, chemical infusion of a, uh, of a pigment that's taken up tremendously by the tumor cells that's then subsequently activated by directly targeted laser. It's better for things behind the airway wall. So I'm not Brachy therapy, similar to how you would have radiation therapy for seed implantation, perhaps for prostate cancer, where you put your radiation therapy material into the target organ, like the prostate. This would be leaving um, radiation therapy cath catheters in the airway to then deliver radiation in a targeted field around the tumor, avoiding direct beam radiation across the chest. Cold therapies, uh, well, free stuff. You can freeze it down and that will uh, alleviate the problem. That's a little step more on this. And then mechanical therapies that are neither hot nor cold, uh, and it's just debris techniques. Just essentially just ripping it apart. Grabbing a piece with, with cold forceps and just ripping it and pulling, ripping and pulling until all the material is out. Balloon dilation, same thing. You put a, 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 an inflatable balloon across the obstruction, inflate the balloon to a measurable pressure, you just push the airway open. And then stenting to support the airway if extremely compromised is still a problem. Okay. So a little bit more on some of those modalities and why we've progressed with what we've been doing in terms of the rationale. Uh, there's laser. Uh, laser is a very interesting science technology. Based on the different types of laser, what kind of metals you use as your laser emitter and how you activate the laser beam, you generate different kind of wattage and different kind of scatter and absorption of the light and therefore different amount of penetration into the tissue. But it's still a really super, super, super fancy expensive flashlight, in which case it only goes straight, right? And you can't bend that unless you have something to bend the arc, okay? Um, so this is, you know, you directly aim at the target and you zap it until you basically burn and cauterize the tissue back. But as I said, it's only a straight area. And since this is a 
heat therapy, if you're applying heat into the airway, wouldn't we also have to deliver that stuff called oxygen in some amount? This, this would include some risk of airway fire. And that's no fun. It's manageable risk, but risk nonetheless. Okay. So another device that's utilized, this uh, is uh, argon plasma coagulation. This is a non-contact modality similar to laser, where it's using an argon gas uh, jet sprayed out of the catheter that's uh, brought into the airway through the traditional therapeutic bronchoscope to use for coagulation of superficial abnormalities. Great for stopping hemorrhage after hemorrhage happens for some other reason also. So superficial tissue destruction, not so helpful at getting deep, deep, deep into the tumor bed, but it'll just, it's a nice thing to stop that bleeding. Okay. Uh, this device is utilized in our, in our uh, GI colleagues for superficial, you know, AV malformations in the stomach. It'll cauterize this very superficially. They don't need to destroy the whole area. They just need to kind of, you know, buzz it quick so it doesn't bleed again. Okay. How this works? You have either side fire or straight fire gas, in terms of where the gas is shot out of the, out of the catheter. You can directly visualize that it's going to this little area of abnormal tissue. You get the gas beam to get closest to that tissue, but don't actually touch it. Activate the gas, has the electrical current go through it as the fifth conducting medium, and then that will uh, cauterize or vaporize even you know, how long you expose the tissue to the, to the treatment. Okay. And because of the side fire capability of the gas, you can treat around the corner. So as opposed to laser beam, which has to be straight. This you can kind of bend into more awkward directions. Okay. Again, it is hot. Hot things in oxygen are combustible. So we have to manage the oxygen risk. When we keep looking at the ventilator that's used in the operating room. Uh, as a, another risk to this, although exceptionally uncommon, is a gas embolus. We're expelling a jet of argon gas, which is inert, but it is still a gas. And a gas embolus could plausibly cause a risk to the patient. Uh, endobronchial electrocautery, in terms of just taking five, five C4 or like Schneer uh, allopectomy uh, device uh, into the airway. This is a very popular uh, device because you can pull out big pieces and cauterize and remove device all at the same time. So it's very suitable for central airway tumors. You have a, a, a loop snare, just like you have the same device used in colonoscopy to loop out a, a, a polyp on a stalk, looking like a piece of broccoli coming off the colon wall. You loop it. You can slowly close the wire snare around the base of that pulp or tumor in the airway. Activate the electric cautery, slices it off, cauterize it in the same pass, and I have a nice big piece of material to the pathologist, and bleeding risk is done. It's cauterized, it's not going to bleed. Okay. It's going to be used both through rigid or flexible bronchoscope. We've been doing flexible bronchoscopy, that's our thermal uh, mount, and like every electrical therapy, we have to ground them to, to the electrical ground. Some of the devices will direct probes, we just kind of touch and burn, essentially. Uh, probes, we grab, cauterize, and rip. And I mentioned the, the snare. The snare is my favorite. You get the biggest pieces out in fast amount of time. Okay? So why one device or another in terms of these hot things? Well, laser, because of the cost of acquisition and the complication rate, despite its effect efficacy for a very rapid resolution of the central liver tumor, it's kind of a harder thing to go after because it just costs a lot more. We should be good stewards of the money we use, right? Whereas electric cautery and APC are already in house from GI. No new money. Good stewards, good treatment. Okay? Complication rates are similar but manageable. Maneuverability is excellent for both, certainly in comparison to the laser. Effectiveness, the same, different, they're complementary. The electric cautery is for the removal of a large amount of material. The APC is to help augment hemostasis if hemostasis is necessary. Treatment time, perhaps, depending on how many big pieces you get out, maybe laser is faster, but more costly, more in depth, more risk, often not necessary. Okay. And some of the newer things that we're, we're looking to uh, include as well this is a cryotherapy. Uh, cryotherapy has been around for many, many millennia of cooling things down. You know, um, so people are thinking of how do we freeze things down to offer this cold, which would have no risk of fire, of course, uh, to damage cells, destroy cells, destroy tumors, destroy warts, all kinds of things. Same basic concepts apply. How this cold therapy affects 
cellular death is you have intra and extracellular ice crystals form. That damages the organelles, particularly the mitochondria inside, which are the, the factories of energy for the cells. They don't really like to take a joke in terms of uh, this ice crystal formation. You have all these transcellular shifts of water flushing back and forth across the cell wall. This can lead to local vasoconstriction. Local vasoconstriction leads to ischemic thrombosis of that tissue. Then. So it's not going to blood flow, and the cells don't work. The cells will die. Okay. And there's uh, postulated there is immune-mediated cell death as well. You can activate a activation of lymphocytes and things nearby. They get recruited to this cold area. They also can join the body to attack the tumor cells. This would be this is some of the, the mechanisms. <coughs> some of these mechanisms do take time to occur. So if you've ever had a ward frozen, you, you walk out of the clinic, it looks, looks kind of like how you started. And only three days later, you start to see a change on your skin. Same principles apply. This cryoprobe is a contact device, so you touch it with this cold probe. It uses nitrous oxide uh, as the predominant cryogen. As gases expand rapidly, they cool very quickly, down to negative 89 Celsius is the target temperature. Uh, and then can adhere and freeze in cycles around the tumor. Likewise, you can freeze, grab on, and pull, and extract large pieces of tumor as well. Fortunately, this also takes into account cells that don't freeze so much and don't take this damage so much are based on water content. If there's lots of water content, they will freeze and have these freeze-thaw cycles that are very injurious to the cells. If they do not have high water content, Namely, all of those healthy, normal things we want to leave behind, the freeze-thaw cycles will not damage them. In which case, we can freeze the tumor into oblivion, and the healthy stuff will be left behind. Okay. This is a good thing. Okay. And I said, uh, foreign body retrieval is also helpful. Because if you have a slippery foreign body if that has a high water content, because it's a food particle, or uh, a big thrombosis from a, someone's coughing out blood, you can freeze it and extract the thing in total instead of wrapping it out in the piece. I'll show you a picture of a clot cycle in a second. Um, so the uh, cell death, right, like freeze time, how, how long you keep it cold, how rapidly it rewarms, this flooding in and out of warm and cold effects, uh, how cold you get it, the water comes in, how many times uh, you cycle between warm and cold, 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 back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay, for example, as I said, you can mention you can put the probe in to a bronchoscope, see a central airway obstruction, freeze onto it, make that act like glue, and while the probe is still activated and freezing the tissue, pull out the whole bronchoscope and remove the tumor. Here's an example published in the literature. This is a, so looking at the bronchoscope, uh, left is left and right is right. So this is the left main stem. Here's the right main stem obstructed by this ugly thing that doesn't belong there. Okay, here's the, the probe. It advances through a bronchoscope under real-time guidance. You see what you're doing, which is always an advantage. You activate the, the cryogen. You start to see this snowstorm of cold around the target. And then you start to see crystallization of white on the target, which looks like this in close up. It just goes white. Like if you freeze your hand, it goes white. Blanched out of all the blood flow. Same thing. This one then, while still cooling the target, pulled out the bronchoscope leaving the breathing tube behind during an anesthetic, and extracted this large tumor in mass, essentially. So it pulled and ripped. Some little hemorrhage had to be managed at the side, but that was quite fixable. And you now have, going from this, with shortness of breath, cough, phlegm, symptom-causing problem, to normal airway patency and function. Upgrade within one trip to the OR. This is a picture of a very traditional therapeutic bronchoscope, um, extending the cold probe beyond it. So you have this little ice ball. That's what it's put onto just for demonstration purposes. You put it in water while you're testing it to make sure it is getting as cold as you like. And these are examples of what we will be referred to as clotsicles. So frondus, frozen, extracted. Yes, I know you all are eating, but I have to show a clotsicle. It's part of the talk. All right, another device that is that is uh, in that is. Uh, group or developed for group or use is spray cryotherapy. This is this is a non-contact form. The other one is a contact form. We're actually touching the thing. So this is a, 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 a animation uh, uh, where you have this basically just long, itty bitty drinking straw through the bronchoscope. 
spraying on liquid nitrogen as their cryogen. Liquid nitrogen is much colder when it expands uh, to standard temperature and pressure uh, than nitrous oxide, in which case the temperature achieved is much, much colder. Negative 196 C, this is very, very cold, very, very fast. So those freeze thaw cycles get very, very cold, cold very quickly, and then can rewarm. However, uh, this can be painted over an area of 200 centimeters, a very superficial, you kind of paint the whole area and freeze it all very, very quickly. Uh, however, gases do expand. This is how the principle of the cooling effect happens. When you, when you, when liquid nitrogen turns to gaseous nitrogen at body temperature, it will expand at a ratio of one to seven hundred. That's that's physics. Okay. In which case, we have to vent that gas because otherwise we're exposing the, the a liter, we expel a liter of gas. The patient's thorax cannot tolerate seven hundred liters of volume, so we have to vent it. Okay. So no thorax is the risk. So again, comparative uh, ablative therapies, adding, adding in the, the cold therapy that I mentioned, com uh, contrasting to the laser and APC and natural cautery we talked about. Cryoprobe is a reusable device. It is cheaper by comparison to the laser or the spray in the acquisition, uh, so reusable. Uh, if you're just doing cryoprobe alone, a freezing thaw, freeze thaw, freeze thaw, not pulling out big pieces, you have to go back in to go remove all that slough material later on, because you're not actually removing it. But if you remove it at the same time, as part of a multiple pronged approach of hot and cold therapies in tandem, this repeat bronchoscopy would not be necessary. Because that secretion removal, that's excellent for, for the cold probe. The other things, they're, they're not going to grab it necessarily. Hemostasis is controlled with cryoprobe, but it often not need delaying effect. Barotrauma of a, of a pneumothorax is not is really just unique to the cryo spray due to the ex expansion of the gas. And cold therapies around a foreign body, a metallic foreign body, are less likely to injure. As opposed to lighting it, not making it hotter, if you just cool it down, you're not going to injure that, that extent, that metallic structure. The other devices, APC, electric cautery, have both uh, disposable and, re and re reusable uh, devices. Okay. So I mentioned on uh, bronchial stenting. I said if the airways normal on the inside, but crush on the outside, you have to prop it open. So stenting in that regard is uh, to be considered. And there's lots of different styles. Lots of companies make different stents, different models, different brands. Essentially, you can have metallic stents in some capacity of the nitinol or some other uh, very thin, flexible metal. Uh, and they can be, uh, or they can be silicone. And I'll talk about the silicone in a second. Uh, you can uh, then have uncovered stents, where there's no kind of clear, non-porous coating. Or you can have covered stents. And they both come in each. And there's some rationale for either one. Here's an example of a a coated wire uh, stent. They be deployed again alongside a traditional therapeutic bronchoscope, a flexible bronchoscope, in which case you have this airway tumor crushing the airway from the outside in. The central airway stuff inside the pipe is cleaned out first. <clears throat> the lung beyond the obstruction, so you want to salvage the healthy lung. And you deploy this stent across that obstruction. Stending is a very common phenomenon in multiple different areas of medicine, cardiac most, most uh, well described. But the idea in the coronary, just like in here, the stuff beyond the obstruction has to function. If it doesn't function, opening it up is not going to do any good because you're just opening up to nowhere. If there's no lung out here that works, opening up won't do them any good. If the lung beyond the obstruction is healthy, opening up like you like opening up the obstructive coronary disease and help that healthy myocardium downstream. Same concept. So again, the, the trachea bronchial stents, two categories, metallic and silicone. Metallic, because of how they uh, conform to the airway and kind of get partially endothelialized, they are less risk of migration. However, at downside, they are harder to remove because of the same reasons. Right? Uh, and in fact, metallic stents are actually approved with the caveat that they are designed to leave in indefinitely. They're actually not approved for removal. Knowing that occasionally like the foreign body it, it migrates and gets expectorated. Uh, erosion is possible, and due to their, their thin distance, thin wall diameter, there's a better inner to outer ratio to allow for maximal cross sectional area to breathe through. They're much, much thinner, so you have more space to breathe as opposed to having you know, extra thickness of plastic. And they're mentioned to avoid in benign disease. So we're going to have a benign subglottic stenosis from prior tracheostomy, for instance. That person has a, should be a long life expectancy, 
in which case they're likely to have complications of the metallic stent in that benign disease process. So we generally should not use metallic stents in those benign. Silicon stents, notice of a silicon tube, which I'll show you a, a case example of, these don't adhere to the airway wall as well. That's how they're made. Oh, so therefore they can migrate more. That, that's a, that could be a downside. However, ease of removal is a plus side. And they're basically the same thing. Uh, because of their less flexibility and less able to deployment uh, through a flexible bronch, so it would have to be done through a rigid bronch, which is a harder thing to, to, to do. Uh, you basically customize these on site. You measure based on your CAT scan, you measure based on your bronchoscopy, and then you give little scissors and snip this little piece of plastic you know, silicon tubing to match what your, your person needs. Uh, because of the, the less adherence to the wall, uh, you get less intracellular clearance, so mucus plugging and you know, halitosis can be more of a nuisance. And these are approved for both benign and malignant disease. But of course, we're focusing on malignant disease because that's our, our population that's of most interest. So some case examples. I do want to talk about cases we have done to date uh, and cases we couldn't do to date based on our available uh, technology. Okay. So here's a 76-year-old gentleman. He's a VA patient uh, uh, with metastatic melanoma. Uh, other cancers can metastasize to the airways. Uh, lung cancer. Metastasis to a different airway is the most common. Breast cancer, second of that. Melanoma and renal cancer would be the rounding out the top four of troublemakers going to the airway. So he had melanoma. And you see, if you look at his x-ray, he has right lung, nicely inflated and functional. That's lots of air going in and out. Left side, not too much of any air going in and out. He's short breath. He's on supplemental oxygen. He was never on supplemental oxygen. He has a problem. And you see his airway, his trachea, is pulled toward the side of the white stuff, which means he has collapse. He has something blocking his air tubes. Okay. So on cross section, he had a CAT scan also to clarify the, the, the answer. This is, a, this is a simple section of the left lower lobe of his lung, and you see, in contrast to the healthy right lower lobe, which has all these healthy air spaces, his left lower lobe really has no air. It's completely deflated. Okay. So with therapeutic bronchoscopy, combination of electric cautery, Cryoprobe and APC. We're able to completely remove the interbronchial tumor and allow him to reinflate his left lung. Gets discharged to home on room air about three days later. This a uh, very complicated story. Uh, it's a 43 year old male with now, at this, at this point, recurrent small cell lung cancer. So, already a very bad, challenging story. Okay. Similarly, his x ray, left side of lung, looks pretty happy and healthy. Right side of the lung, no air in it. Because he has a malignant central airway obstruction block, blocking his right main stem. So there's nothing getting past that. Additionally, he's also doing very, we're doing very poorly at this point. I know this, but I care of him. Two, because I can see he's got an intracheal tube, he's intubated in the ICU. He's got an orgasmic feeding tube and a central line, and this is really bad. There's really no chance of getting this out of ventilator if we don't open his lung up. Okay? He, at the time, was on 100% FiO2 oxygen, 100% oxygen through the ventilator. So our ICU vents were doing the best they possibly do to oxygenate him. Okay? I mentioned airway fire is the same possibility with hot therapies in the airway. We can attenuate that risk by keeping the F to oxygen fraction at 40% or less. So he stayed on this ventilator, brought to the, brought to the upper room, consent from family, of course, and with very close attention from our anesthesia colleagues, where it was to manage him throughout the entire case on lower oxygen limitations, basically of turning the oxygen up and, on, up and down, up and down, up and down throughout the entire time. No complication of fire, no complication of bleeding, and it's post procedure x-ray, so it's his right lung completely re okay. This is a gentleman who had zero chance of survival off the ventilator on 100% oxygen. And it was taken to the operating room and completely open up his lung. Yes, he has a life limiting diagnosis. He has met, relapsed small cell lung cancer. This is not going to be survivable ultimately. And ultimately, he did pass away. But not from choice of breath. Okay. So, another case of someone we could not take care of due to what we haven't had today. So, another 44 year old male. Yes, young patients get lung cancer. This is, this is not super fun. Um, so, he had uh, progressive non small cell lung cancer. Progress despite treatment A, B, and C. See his lung, 
the tumor resided uh, in the right upper lobe in the lung. So now this portion is really not functional, and it's just replaced by tumor. So open up the airways for that portion is not going to help. The whole bottom half of his lung has no air in it because the airways are obstructed. His was a completely extrinsic obstruction. Nothing in the air tubes I could clean up. So I couldn't do the endobronchial therapy alone and do it any good. He had to have a stent place. Ultimately, after a multi-day hospital wait to get a, a tertiary care center, he goes to Lake Clinic, and he gets an airway stent, and his right main stem opened up. It's hard to see based on this uh, projection, but in here is, is a small trach a bronchial stent that propped open his right middle and right lower lobe. He then had months of improved shortness of breath, months to pursue additional tests, additional clinical trials that he wanted to try because of his young age and otherwise excellent performance status. He only had an excellent performance status because his right lung was given back. There's a little stem, a little red animation. Okay. Another patient we did take care of here, 71 uh, year old male with non small cell adenocarcinoma lung cancer of the left upper lobe. So the tumor resides in here. Again, it comes in with progressive shortness of breath. Coughing up some flights of blood as well, but really not that much in terms of how bad the bleeding was. Left lung has no air in it. Again, short of breath. Can't get around. Can't take care of himself at home. Take him to the operating room. Again. And fully recanalize all the way down to his left lower lobe, reinflating the remaining portion of his left upper and giving his entire left lower lobe work. One case that I will mention, in terms of this, how the stenting role comes in. Uh, this is a 73-year-old woman with uh, hepatitis she's a long-term smoker. So I put in some imaging uh, of her kind of before and after. You see, off the air tube should be nice and smooth and open, going out to her left lung as they were. But she has this big growth of abnormality coming off her main carina, the main split between right and left lungs, blocking almost the entirety of her right lung, but at this point, she still is getting air past it, and almost like a ball valve kind of <coughs> phenomenon. So she's getting air past it. But there's something wrong, very seriously. This is stage 3B lung cancer. Good survival uh, out to five years would be around 9% approximately. Treatment for this to curative intent therapy would include chemotherapy and radiation in combination. This is what you would need to do. However, she's short breath tying her shoes. She can't walk to go into one of our nice oncologist offices to get treated. No radiation therapy to lie down to get treated. Okay. So she goes to Beth Israel uh, as a tertiary care referral. This is a silicon Y stent that so shaped to conform to the, the split of the airway. They debulk this endobronchial tumor. They discharge her to home on no extra oxygen. She's feeling much better. She gets definitive dose chemo radiotherapy from here at the patient center. And by the way, this picture was 2014. She's still doing very, very well. Four years later, what should have been a lethal diagnosis four years ago, because we were able to treat her because she got her airways opened up. All right, so there's complications. Why we are really cautious about doing these things? Well, we don't want to cause problems with bleeding or airway fires. So we make the oxygen break down. We carry on the thorax. We carry on the lung or airway laceration, which are very, very minimal, but they're theoretically possible. Related complications to mention, of course, tumor ingrowth, which is really a natural progression. It's not a complication of the procedure. It's just the disease keeps coming, unless you can treat it all the way. Granulation tissue around the stent, it's a foreign body. A foreign body reaction around the material can generate this inflammatory scar, keloid esque kind of stuff that can be in the way. Mucus plug on the foreign body, migrations, and pneumonias. So, airway patency, mucolytics, inhalers, nebulized treatments, all these things that kind of help keep the stent patent. So they can keep their functional status more controlled. Okay? Those things we've been uh, have to be cautious of. Uh, so the final summary to, to mention uh, is rapid recanalization of malignant obstructions can palliate the limiting respiratory symptoms. Get them discharged, get them functioning again, get them feeling better to get to their therapies. Avoid tertiary care referral and delay the discharge. This is a good thing. We don't want a patient patient. That patient's stuck in our with the treatment, we can't do anything about it. We either have to move them or treat them. And we can treat them, we just have the supplies and the the institutional setup to be able to do it. 
Uh, and this, all of this does support our strategic plan to expand thoracic oncology in our, in our capital region. We have, we have one of the few thoracic surgeons in the state, one of the few pulmonologists who've been trained to do this in the state. We have a large catchment area with a defined integrated electromedical record to make sure all these things can happen in a timely fashion. The screening, the oncology referrals, the radiation treatments, um, and the palliative care service, all to involve in our care. So it's all of these multi multimodal, multidisciplinary approaches that give our patients good care. Uh, this should be included as palliation symptoms and improving their functional status. So with that, I'm to take any questions. I do have to leave with one closing slide of all lung cancer talks I give. This one? Uh, yes, I am a board certified pulmonologist, but I know with 100% certainty that that is a lung cancer. Does anyone know why I am certain of such a thing? Because that is their pack of smokes on the exact same picture of the cancer. Okay. So with 100% certainty, that is a positive test for lung cancer. So yes, we've seen the enemy. Smoking rates are falling, but they are not gone. Even if all cigarettes have vanished from the planet today, we'll still have 20 or 30 years of fallout to do. So we should take care of them correctly. Yes, questions? Does vaping play into this at all? Not known yet. Not known yet. That's not been enough long-term perspective information. It took decades to get the data about cigarettes. Decades still to act on the data of cigarettes. So we are far behind in vaping. What I tell my patients is, if you're going to use this as a tool to quit cigarettes or a short-term bridge, this is probably less bad than cigarettes. As a destination, as an ongoing customer to the vaping industry, probably not a good thing. We just don't have the proof of that yet. Yes? So are which, if any, of these technologies um, or procedures are beneficial to people who have mucus tumors? Uh, mucinous tumors? Mucus, well. So mucus plugging. Yeah, mucus, just mucus. <clears throat> so if someone has a pneumonia and they're plugging up, plugging up, they have all this junk they can't expectorate. Uh, first we do all the non-invasive, non-bronchoscopic approaches first. Uh -huh. Because ultimately that problem is going to last longer than the duration of the bronchoscope. Um, but if someone really has refractory cough and just keeps plugging up, uh, the vacuum effect of the bronchoscope is often sufficient. If it's not, we have to instill medicines or uh, things to loosen, loosen the phlegm so it can be vacuumed out. Beyond that, the cryoprobe, the contact cryoprobe, would be the, the device to utilize. Because you could put the cryoprobe into this water-rich mucus obstruction, freeze it, and extract it in total. Any questions? So that's why the cases we've been doing is a combination, I said, this multidisciplinary approach you uh, hearing about myself and Dr. Pope, our thoracic surgeon. Do we have all the technology we need here to be able to do everything you want to do? The cryoprobe we've been getting on loan from the company thus far. So that's not currently in-house. So that's, that's a goal. That's a goal. The APC and electric pottery, those are in-house because that's standard fare for the guest. Uh, the cryoprobe is the thing that's not currently here. Uh, we're certainly well, in the process of pursuing that, of course. Uh, because if we're going to put in stents, you have to manage that company which are better served with the cold therapies, not the hot therapies. If you're gonna do one, again, you do it right, or you don't do it at all. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for all the, the good work you've helped us with at Hunter Hospital.